Hello, my name is Eva and I run the account Notation is Great on Twitter. So today I'm going to cover the notation of plain chant, so the so-called news, which is one of the earliest notations that we have in Western art music. And this is going to be the first of two videos. Neum is a Greek word meaning brief or sign, depending on the etymology that uh, you go with. And basically a neum is a sign which, which indicates either a note or a group of two, three, four notes or so. So how did neums look like? Well, here we have a table which comes from the Grove Dictionary of Music, but there are many such tables and in many books about medieval music, online, etc. So if we have a look at the columns here, we see that you have names of different regions in Europe. So you have French, St. Gallen, North Spain, and so on. And then in the rows, you have different types of neumes, different names. So you have virga and punctum, both of which are one single note. The punctum tends to be a lower note and the virga tends to be a higher note. Pes, which is two ascending notes, clivis, which is two descending notes, and so on. So basically, uh, if we look at this table, we can see that each of these neumes was written slightly different in each of these regional systems. Okay, so up to the 11th century, each region in Europe had its own regional neumes. But as you can see, there are similarities between them. So the, uh, for example, the PES in the French area was this kind of ascending line, which looked quite similar to the St. Gallen one. So they are not completely different. There are strong similarities. And at a certain point, the neumes got all unified. And I'll talk about that in the next video. But maybe something to, um, to learn from this is that in the Middle Ages and up to the invention of the printing press, notation was not as standardized as it is today for very obvious reasons. So obviously in medieval Europe, you had scribes, you had monks traveling from one region to the other, but obviously this was much more limited compared to, to the present day situation. So each region or each tradition would develop its own system of neumes, which was still quite similar to other systems, but it had its own particularities. So the first neumes that we find look something like this. So this is from the Antiphonary of Leon, which is a city in the north of Spain. And as you can see, we find some of the neumes, some of the shapes we found in that uh, table earlier on. And you might say, well, this is all very well, but how do I figure out the, the pitches? So yeah, you are completely right. So here, as you can see, we don't have a staff, we don't have a clef. We know when the melodic line is going up or down, but we don't know exactly by how much. So for example, if we have a pes, would that be a second? Would that be a third? Well, the answer is we don't know. So something that people sometimes ask me when I post these examples of notation on Twitter or when I teach students is, so what use was this notation if you cannot even figure out the pitches? So by the way, because this notation doesn't have a staff, it's called staffless notation or a diastematic notation, which is the Greek word, or in campo aperto, which in Latin means in an open field. So exactly what use was this notation? Well, in order to answer that question, we need to understand the context in which these manuscripts were produced. So if you think of the Middle Ages, plain chant in, in the Middle Ages, it was a very different musical context than we have today. So in the Middle Ages, if you wanted to be a monk or a nun, you would enter a monastery at a very young age, maybe as young as seven or eight. And an important part of your education would be to learn plain chant, okay? So plain chant is a very complex repertoire with different pieces for different times of the liturgical year, for different feasts, feasts of different saints. And so part of your education would be to learn as many as seven or 8,000 pieces by heart, okay? Obviously, at a certain point, this became a bit too much. Uh, it was difficult for the monks to remember such a big repertoire. And so this is how these earlier examples of notation developed. Okay, so they were meant to be an ed memoir. 
So the idea was that you would have learned the piece from memory at some point in your education and with the help of the news you would remember the piece uh, by seeing the news. But it's important to say that this kind of notation it's not meant to for someone who is not familiar with the piece to just grab a book and just be able to read it from scratch. That's not what it is about. So in this context, I think it makes a bit more sense to understand how these news worked. So if we don't have a staff, can we still figure out the pitches somehow? Well, there are a few paths open to us. So one of them would be if you can find a version of the same piece in with staff notation, uh, sometimes this happens. So then obviously you can compare the two notations more easily and you can figure out what the staffless news actually mean. Uh, some musicologists have tried to uh, transcribe staffless notation even if there is no staff notation version, such as, such as for example Susan Ranking with the Winchester Tropper, which you have an example here, and Emma Hornby with Old Hispanic Chant. So obviously these kinds of reconstructions are very hypothetical, so obviously they are based on research, they are based on comparisons with uh, other repertoires, they are based on very detailed, very dedicated study of formulas, of um, motifs and so on. So in a way you can never say, well I'm 100% 100% sure that this is how it sounded like, but anyway this is very worthwhile research. And this is, I think, the, the only way that you, we can have an idea of how these chants would have sounded like. So we have another example here from the Germanic area. Uh, so as you can see, it follows the same principle. Again, uh, what about rhythm and pulse? So was this indicated in any way? Well, the answer is that for plain chant, even when the staff makes an appearance, rhythm and pulse weren't indicated in any particular way. Uh, what musicologists think is that the rhythm was very heavily influenced by the text, so it, it didn't tend to have a sort of particular rhythm, but you could try and say the text and express the text as, as clearly and as expressively as you could. So as you can see, this notation is very different to our own because we don't know the pitch, we don't know the rhythm, so what is this notation good for? Well, the answer is that the neumes could sometimes express as aspects of the music that we don't express so easily today. So for example, if we have a look at this neum here in the table, which is called Aquilisma, so you can see here how it looks in different types of notations. Well, it is thought that what Aquilisma meant is that the note would have to be sung with a kind of tremolo, a kind of oscillation. I mean, it's not completely sure that this is the case, but this is what musicologists think. So my point here is that the news very often give us indications about articulation or about the quality of the voice or about certain, certain types of ornaments that are not so easy to write down in our present day notation. So even though the news are perhaps not as good as our current notation system to express certain things, they did express others that perhaps we are not so familiar with these days. So this was a few basics of staffless notation. If you have learned something from this video, I would like to invite you to consider making a donation to one of the charities below, which support musicians affected by the coronavirus crisis. So other than that, I hope you've enjoyed this video. And remember, there will be a second one uh, covering more news. Other than that, thanks for listening and goodbye.